Proverbs is, I wouldn't say Proverbs is like my favorite book, but I like it a lot because, you know, like you read through the Bible or you've read several other books and then sometimes you, you sit down and you think, well, what do I want to read next, you know? And, you know, when you get to be my age, 39, um, you've read everything a, a few times, probably Leviticus less than anything, but um, I always like to go, if I'm starting, if it's a month and it's like 31 days, Proverbs. So if you, a chapter a day, 31 chapters in Proverbs, and you go through that. And I don't care how many times I go through it, I always find stuff. You know, you read these Proverbs, and, they, and a lot of them just kind of stand alone. You know, it's not, it doesn't take a lot of interpretation. But every now and then, there's one that'll jump out, and you know you've read it, you know, 20 times before. And, it, and this proverb was one of those in Proverbs 29, 18. You'll recognize it probably from the King James Version. It says, where there is no vision, the people perish. But he that keepeth the law, happy is he. But I was reading in the New King James, and so I didn't recognize it at first, except I, I like the way it's worded. It says, where there is no revelation, the people cast off restraint. But happy is he who keeps the law. So we're going to talk about or break this down and talk about what are we talking about? Revelation, what is um, casting off restraint and being happy? So if we're talking about vision or revelation, we're talking about the Word. We're talking about uh, not the book of Revelation, because that hasn't been written yet, but in the times that the Proverbs were in the Old Testament, it's the law. So he's saying that where the law is not, where there is no law, where they don't have the law, then people perish or they cast off restraint. So in, in 1 Samuel, <clears throat> because I'm younger than I thought, I haven't reached puberty yet. First um, Samuel 3 1 he says now the boy Samuel ministered to the Lord before Eli and the word of the Lord was rare in those days there was no widespread revelation and Hosea says my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge because thou hast rejected knowledge I will also reject thee thou that thou shalt be, there shall be no priest to me. Seeing thou hast forgotten the law of thy God, I will also forget my children. So there's even a time when God holds back the word. And then in Amos, he says, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord God, that I will send a famine in the land, not a famine of bread, nor of thirst of water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. And they shall wander from sea to sea and from the north even to the east. They shall run to and fro to seek the word of the Lord and shall not find it. So those are, the prophet, those are prophets from the Old Testament during the times of the, that they were in captivity or in the times of the judges. But in the New Testament, there was still the problem. There wasn't, the Bible wasn't written yet, and that still they had the problem where it wasn't prevalent. So, in Matthew 9, 36, it says, But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion for them, because they were weary and scattered like sheep, having no shepherd. And in Romans 10, 13, for whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall the preacher, how shall they preach unless they are sent? 
As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, who bring glad tidings of good news. So like I was saying, there weren't any Bibles at that time, and they didn't, you didn't go down to Dalton's Torah shop and buy, you know, the, the guys down there, okay, here's a nice Torah and lambskin, lambskin, or we got the bonded leather if you can't afford that, or there's the hardbound or the paperback. So um, when you think about it, we always, you know, you think like Jerusalem, the city of David, and people went to the temple, but what about the people that didn't live right in Jerusalem, you know? They lived in other parts of Israel, in small rural areas, you know, farms and stuff. They didn't have, a, you know, the law right there available to them all the time. I mean, how many in here own only one Bible? Yeah, I mean, we got, I don't know, I probably have six Bibles in my house, probably not all mine, but I mean just with my family. And then you can go online. Uh, there's a one called the Blue Letter Bible that's out there that uh, has all commentaries. You can, you find, you know, search for the verse, and then it has tools, you click on tools, and there's all these, you can get dictionaries, expository things, and it's, it's really amazing what we have at our fingertips now. But they didn't have that. So how did they get the word? What was it normally? What happened? So what they had were prophets. Now, we always think of prophets as somebody that sees into the future or whatever, but that was only part of the job. The prophet proclaimed the message given to him as the seer. beheld. He beholds the vision of God in Numbers. I'm sorry, for those that take notes, I'm going to do a lot of verses, so write fast. So, Or you can ask me later if you missed one because I think I have them all annotated here. Uh, so in Numbers 12, 6 and 8, it says, Then he said, Hear now my words. If there is a prophet among you, I, the Lord, make myself known to him in a vision. I speak to him in a dream. Thus a prophet was a spokesman for God. He spoke in God's name and by his authority. In Exodus 7, So the Lord said to Moses, See, I have made you as God to Pharaoh, and Aaron your brother shall be your prophet. So, the prophets, the mouth of God, speaking to men, and hence what the prophet says is not of man, but of God. In Jeremiah 1, he says, Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth, and the Lord said unto me, Behold, I have put my words in your mouth. And I have put my words, and in Isaiah 51, 16, he says, and I have put my words in your mouth, and I have covered thee in the shadow of mine hand, that I may plant the heavens and lay the foundations of the earth, and say unto Zion, Thou art my people. And even in the New Testament, Second Peter 1, 20 and 21, knowing this, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecies came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. So I don't know. I, I'd have to say personally, you know, I always read about the prophets, this and that, and special people, but I didn't know. It just didn't really click until I started looking into this scripture just... Uh, that that really was the way. That was the internet. That was how they got the word out to people. I didn't, it just never clicked, I guess, with me that this was... so central to the spreading of the word, getting the law out to people. So the prophets were instruments of God for the communications of his mind and will to men. 
He says in Deuteronomy, I will raise up a prophet from among their brethren like unto thee and will put my words in his mouth and he shall speak unto them and, and that I shall command him and it shall come to pass that whosoever will not hearken unto my words which he shall speak in my name, I will require it of him. And Deuteronomy, I think, uh, maybe it's verse 20, gets into what do you do about false prophets and how do you know what a false prophet is? You know, if they claim to speak in God's name, but what they say doesn't come to pass, like up there it says, what I say will come to pass. If it doesn't come to pass, then you take them out and stone them because they are a false prophet. So, the whole word of God may in this general sense be spoken of as prophetic inasmuch as it is written, but it was written by men who received the revelation. And the revelation that was communicated to them from God. So no matter what the nature might be, the foretelling of future events was not necessary but only an incidental part of the prophetic office. The great task assigned to the prophets from whom God raised up among the people was to, and this is important, <laughs> to correct moral and religious abuses, to proclaim the great moral and religious truths which are connected with the character of God and which lie at the foundation of his government. So the very nature of law, it's, it's a normative claim against behavior. He's laying out, these are the morals that I demand. To expose religious abuses. And expounding on the truths about his character. Love, goodness, truth, beauty. That he's a God of wrath, God of judgment, and also a God of mercy and grace. So, anyone that was doing that, who was a spokesman for God to man, would be called a prophet. And we're famous, we, we know a lot of... Uh, you know, like the major prophets and the minor prophets. But then Enoch, Abraham, Moses, Miriam, Deborah, there were also prophets in the strict sense of the, of the term. But while the prophetic gift was thus exercised from the beginning, the prophetical order as such began with Samuel, which is interesting because I know I've read these verses before. I'm getting part of this, part of this from uh, Easton's uh, Bible Dictionary. Um, but Samuel, they had colleges, schools of the prophets were instituted for the training of prophets who were um, constituted a distinct order. It's in 1 Samuel 19, 18, 24, and 2 Kings 2, 3, 15, 4, 38 which continued to, clo to the close of the Old Testament. Such schools were established at Ramah, Bethel, Gilgal, Gibeah, and Jericho. The sons, or disciples, of the prophets were young men who lived together at these different schools. Uh, these young men were taught not only the rudiments of secular knowledge, but they were brought up to exercise the office of prophet, to preach pure morality and the heartfelt worship of Jehovah, and to act along and coordinately, coordinately with the priesthood and monarchy in guiding the state aright and checking all attempts at illegality and tyranny. Made me think of the Declaration of Independence. Maybe our founding fathers that wrote that were prophets. 
if you haven't read the Declaration of Independence, I highly recommend it. It might give you even more appreciation of, of our country because, and it's a short document, but, and I think I've brought it up before, but it's really a list of grievances against the king telling him where he has violated God's law in dealing with the governed. And that by him violating these points of how the government or the governor deals with the governed, he is in violation of law, God's law and therefore they have the right to separate. So it's interesting because you read it and you think, wow, you know, these guys knew their Bible. It's kind of strange that people say that our founding fathers were secularists. Um, I don't know how they can say that when you read their writings. So um, another great one to read is George Washington's farewell address. Um, see how you could read that and then think he was, uh, you know, not a Christian. Um, so, in the New Testament times, the, prof, the prophetical office was continued. Our Lord is frequently spoken of as a prophet. He was and is the great prophet of the church. There was also in the church a distinct order of prophets uh, who made new revelations from God. They differed from the teacher whose office it was to impart truth already revealed. Hence my reading this. <laughs> I am not a prophet or a preacher. Uh, of the Old Testament prophets, there are 16 whose prophecies form part of the inspired canon. And they divide these up into four groups. There's the prophets of the northern kingdom of Israel, which was Hosea, Amos, Joel, and Jonah. The prophets of Judah, which was the lower kingdom, uh, it was Isaiah, Jeremiah, Obadiah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah. The prophets of captivity, Ezekiel and Daniel. And the prophets of the restoration, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi. So there's quite a heritage there, but an extremely important job. But what was the problem then? Well, we saw a little bit earlier when we were reading that God sometimes withheld his prophets. Uh, he didn't make people perish or cast off restraint. He knows our nature. We are sinful creatures. It says in Second Chronicles 28, 19, For the Lord brought Judah low because of Ahaz, king of Israel, for he had encouraged moral decline in Judah and had been continually unfaithful to the Lord. So by withholding revelation, by withholding the law, the people just cast off restraint. Now Samuel, who we talked about, this was he was during the time of the judges. And it said back there in Samuel uh, three one, it says that and the word of the Lord was rare in those days. And why? Well, you remember in, in the book of Judges, there was like, there were seven cycles of backsliding. You know, they would, they would um, start worshiping idols, intermarrying with the Canaanites, and so on and so forth. And they would get into all kinds of vile things. God would send the ites, you know, the Hittites, the Jebusites, the termites, or whatever, to bring them under submission. And they would cry out to God. God would have mercy on them and raise a judge who would deliver them. 
and then everything would be fine for a while. But then once that judge was gone, they'd start back into that same process. So the reasons for these cycles were, one, disobedience. I mean, that was the main, that's what started it all, because their disobedience was that they didn't get rid of the Canaanites. They were supposed to remove all the Canaanites from the land. But they didn't. And so then they started adopting their idols. They intermarried with, with them, and they um, stopped heeding the judges. They turned away from God when the judges died. And there was general apost apostasy throughout the land. So in Judges, we see it's summed up in verse 21 or chapter 21, 25, it says, In those days there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. So what's wrong with that? Well, what is right in our own eyes? We talk briefly, you know, the Bible says that our hearts are desperately wicked. It says there's no, none righteous, no, not one. In 1 John 2, 16, it says, For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but of the world. In Proverbs 27, 20, Hell and destruction are never full, so the eyes of man are never satisfied. So when we start to do what's right in our own eyes, we revert to our sinful nature. Now what restrains that? But the word. I have a quote here from Robert Charles Winthrop. I think it was in a speech he did in 1844. His grandfather, I think, was the Winthrop who was the first governor of Massachusetts before William Bradford. But he was a congressman and uh, anyway, he says here, men, in a word, must necessarily be controlled either by a power within them or a power without them, either by the word of God or by the strong arm of man, either by the Bible or the bayonet. It may do for other countries and other governments to talk about the state supporting religion. Here, under our own free institution, it is religion which must support the state. But he really sums up Proverbs 29, 18, doesn't he? That we either have to be controlled by something within us or something without us. Either by the word of God or the sword of man. Now our founding fathers established this country on a biblical foundation. And many of the founding fathers belonged to Bible societies where they raised money, printed Bibles, and got them into the hands of the citizens because they knew People who know how to govern themselves don't need a government to tell them what to do. But what have we seen in our country now? They've eroded the word. They're taking the foundation away. They've taken God out of the schools. They've taken him out of uh, the government. They've taken him out of the, you know, the community and ev anywhere they can. They've been a taking the word away. And what do we see around us? People are casting off restraint. So the prophets are, tr are right, are they not? What God said will come to pass is coming to pass yet again in our own time. And when it's happened in the past, His judgment comes. Now, again, I am not a prophet, and I don't know what's, what's going to happen, 
but I see a trend here. And, and our situation isn't necessarily the same as it was in the time of the book of Judges. So God always has a remnant. And I think, um, not to get political or whatever, but uh, when Richard Nixon was running for president, remember, um, well, a lot of you aren't going to remember, um, but this, oh, those of us that are 39 and older might remember, um, he gave a speech right before an election, and at the end he referred to, this part you might have heard, he referred to the silent majority. He said, you know, with all the things that are being said, that, that the silent majority agrees with me on these things. I'm paraphrasing it probably pretty badly, but the key was the silent majority. He wound up winning that election. The silent majority spoke. So when we see what's going on in our country today, the lawlessness, the debauchery, the failing morals, but I can't help but believe that that's just a vocal and very loud minority. I have to believe that there's a silent majority out there. People that are good, honest people that even if they aren't Christian, they hold to the Christian consensus of morals and values that don't like what they're seeing, but they're busy people. They're raising families. They're working. You know, going with their kids to their soccer games and baseball and taking care of elderly parents or whatever. They're just busy. I'm hoping that's the case for us. And I'm hoping that we can reach them and that we can speak out and start standing up that we can bring the word back into the public place. So I'm not ready to write things off just yet. But I remember Billy Graham saying when they, with abortion or with homosexuality growing, I'm pretty sure it was Billy Graham that said that if God doesn't judge America, he's going to have to apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah. And we just seem to be given. And, and talk about cast off. See, it, when it says that um, without vision, the people perish. But I like the New King James Version where it says without revelation, the people cast off restraint. I mean, you can just kind of vision. It's just like, man, you know, I'm free now. I can do whatever I want. There was a story from a, one of the... Um, Holocaust victims in a prison and this German Nazi guard had done something really cruel. I can't remember what it was. And he asked him, why? Why would you do that? And he said, I thank the God that I don't believe in that I can do whatever I want. There's no restraint. If you don't have to answer to anybody, Ultimately, and now we're seeing with the passage of, with the Supreme Court saying that gay marriage is the law of the land, now you see polygamists coming out of the woodwork saying, what about us? And people in other situations, some guy wants to marry his horse, some guy wants to marry his pickup truck. I mean, who's to stop it now? Where are they going to... They've taken an institution that was defined by God and said, okay, we've got this. We know better. You know, this is what it is now. But that's this Supreme Court. It's now all very relativistic. And now it's starting to, you know, we, I used to tell people I knew that we're going down a slippery slope. And they go, oh, that slippery slope thing. Well, now you're hearing people saying, you know, hey, Maybe we should take away, now that that's done, let's do away with tax exemption for churches. Let's start forcing 
you know, churches to, they have to marry us or they violate our civil rights. If you don't bake us a wedding cake, you're going to get fined and thrown in jail. I mean, it's, <laughs> this thing could really snowball. And we could be headed into um, serious situations. Scary, but also pretty interesting. But again, like I said, I'm not a prophet, and I'm not trying to say that I know what's going to happen. But we are, you know, we can see the seasons and the kind of things. And I have been around a while. And, and I, I remember when I first became a Christian, and I would read the book of Revelation and stuff, and I think, like, how could this ever happen? I mean, we're friends with Israel. We're, we're tight with those guys, you know. And nobody's going to come up against us. And, you know, but wow, in 40 years, what has changed? So, but not to leave us on a, a down note. What's next, though, in that verse? If we go back, it says, but happy is he who keeps the law. Proverbs 19.16, he who keeps the commandments keeps his soul. He who is careless of his ways will die. Psalm 19.11, moreover, by them your servant is warned, and in keeping them there is great reward. Psalm 119.2, blessed are those who keep his testimonies, who seek him with the whole heart. Luke 11.28, but he said, more than that, blessed are those who hear the word of God and keep it. And John 13.17, if you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. And I even have more here. But I wanted to read something out of Nehemiah. I came across this verse when we were doing our men's Bible study on Monday nights. A verse popped up um, as part of what we were doing. And um, I'm one who's like, I, I don't like just reading a verse. Okay, because you got to get things in context. And I've been guilty of times of using a verse against somebody only to find out later that that verse didn't mean what I thought it meant. <laughs> and so I'm real careful now because when I read a verse, I like to go back and look, okay, where's the paragraph start that this is in? Because I at least want to read that whole paragraph. But I like to get a flavor. If I haven't been in that book for a while, then I want to get a flavor of what that book is. So I'm sure that I'm not blowing it. And if I've blown it with any of these, you know, please come and tell me. But, so with this one verse, and I don't even remember what the verse was now, but I went back and I started reading this in Ezra, I mean, I'm sorry, Nehemiah 8, verse 4. Um, this, you know, Nehemiah had gotten permission to go back. He was with the Jews capped even in Persia. And they'd already sent uh, two groups back. I'm going to build the temple. And, and he was like the third party going back to rebuild the wall. And uh, Cyrus made him governor. And they go back. But it was not an easy chore. And they had enemies there and around Jerusalem. So I was like holding a sword in one hand and laying bricks with the other and, you know, hot, dirty work and, you know, they hadn't rebuilt the Starbucks yet. And uh, so it wasn't a pleasant task. So at one point, they, Nehemiah takes a break. And in this chapter, it's where Ezra reads the law. So they, people gathered in the square and they wanted him to bring out the law and read it. So I want to start in verse 4. So Ezra the scribe stood on a platform of wood which 
they had made for this purpose. And beside him, at his right hand, stood Metilaha, Shema, Ananiah, Yura, uh, Yura, Helikiah, and Messiah, and at his left hand, Pedala, Mishael, um, Malachiah, Ashim, Habadiah, Zechariah, and uh, Mishalom. And Ezariah opened the book in the sight of all the people, for he was standing above all the people. And when he opened it, and all the people stood up. Wow, respect, right? Respecting the word. And Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God. Then all the people answered, Amen, amen, while lifting up their hands, and they bowed their heads and worshiped the Lord with their faces to the ground. Also, uh, Jeshua, Benai, Sherebiah, Jamin, Akab, uh, Shabbatiah, Hodajiah, Hyasiah, and a bunch of guys that I don't want to pronounce their names anymore, um, and the Levites helped the people to understand the law. And the people stood in their place. So they read directly from the book in the law of God, and they gave the sense and helped them to understand the reading. And Nehemiah, who was the governor, Ezra, the priest and scribe, and the Levites, who taught the people, said to all the people, This day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn nor weep. For all the people wept when they heard the words of the law because they had been deprived of it for so long. It was, they'd been in captivity their whole lives. And he said to them, go your way, eat the fat, drink the sweet, send portions to those whom have nothing um, is prepared for this day is holy to our Lord. Do not sorrow for the joy of the Lord is your strength. So the Levites quieted all the people saying, be still for the day is holy. Do not be grieved. And all the people went their way to eat and drink, to send portions and rejoice greatly because they understood the words that were declared to them. So if you can see God's mercy and you can see the effect that the word had on him. True repentance and God blesses him. He says, okay, heard the word, let's go celebrate. So for us, maybe we are headed into difficult times. We don't really know. No one knows the hour of the day. But remember this, because whatever we may go through, there's a party at the end. So <clears throat> keep reading your word and spreading the word. And maybe we can turn things around, maybe not, but whatever, we need to just be faithful to God and do what we're called to do and know that 
He wins in the end.